Good morning. It's eight o'clock and we're at the intersection. It's really great to see all of you this morning. And I hope we get to, get to see a few more. That would be great too. I'm um, wondering if we have any announcements out there of things that um, the entire community might participate in, um, give other latecomers a little bit more chance to join us. Anyone? I have to admit, I, I have a foggy brain this morning. Um, and I've been sitting here other than Thanksgiving. Uh, next Thursday, we will not be meeting at the intersection. It's the only Thursday of the year that we do not meet. Um, and we all give thanks on that national holiday, um, which gives us the opportunity, I think, very easy opportunity to gather as different faiths together because it is a national holiday. Um, it's not, you know, that day of prayer that is prescribed by one direction or another. It's about people coming together and giving thanks. So that's next Thursday. Uh, to this morning, this is late notice, but there's still time from 9 to 10.30 a.m. this morning at Santa Fe Episcopal uh, here in San Antonio, 9 to 10.30. Folks who answered the domestic violence prevention survey that we put out a while back, not too far back, um, have been invited and are gathering together to move forward and how are we coming together as a faith community to intervene, to prevent um, the domestic violence that's uh, happening in our community. Uh, all of that is leading towards a love summit, a summit on love, that love should not hurt in our homes, our houses of worship and prayer, places where we leave, live, um, that will be happening around February 14th, uh, so start to mark your calendar. We'll be coming with more information on that. Love should never hurt in our houses. So other announcements. I gave you all a little chance to think about other than having to go get your turkey and those things on your to-do list. Martha Ann, you're muted. Martha, and you're muted. Anyone else? Well, Martha's working on that. <laughs> and I can just give a thank you if that's okay. Yay. Go, yeah. Lauren. Thank you for good. <laughs> Well, uh, Lauren Deal, San Antonio Food Bank, just want to thank everybody um, and Martha Ann um, who came out and supported the Feeding Hope event on Sunday. It was it was a beautifully intimate opportunity just to be together. And for me, it was the best opportunity to take a break from the work week and um, truly be filled with gratitude for our for our relationships and um, where we're headed. So just want to say thanks for those who came and Hope that next year folks can join if they're available. So thank you, Ann. Will you be looking for a space for next year? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, we're looking for a space. And generally the the goal for that is um, whatever the theme is, which we haven't come up with, the theme will kind of correlate to the space that we're in. This year it didn't work out for the the sick temple to host. Um, so yeah, we'll be we've kind of been thinking. I've been I've been toying around with the Hindu phrase sewa, so that serve serving humanity, and um, that's been on my heart a lot. So we'll see where that has me ending up. But yeah, thanks, Lauren, Martha, yeah. Ann. Did you want to come back? And, and there you go. Uh, yes, and um, I want to promote the San Antonio. African American Archives and Museum. They have an excellent Black history tour of the river. They do it about once a month, or they will schedule it for you at another time. And uh, a few of us had 
such a fine, fine learning experience on Saturday evening that um, we really want to get, you know, not just an incarnate word group, but more and more people. And we, we can't go forward as citizens together if we don't understand more of the Black history of our city. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha Ann. That one is important. Donna has her hand up, and then we're yes. going to begin. Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to uh, promote our Bridges to Care training that's going to be in person this month on November 29th. It's called Crisis Prevention, Verbal De-Escalation. So uh, that's one that's been asked for. And so we're pleased to be able to bring it in person this, uh, this month. It's going to be at the uh, Bethel uh, Community Development. And if you want to know how to register for it, I'll put the link into the chat. Uh, but please, we, we invite the entire community to come out. Thank you, Donna. And thanks to NAMI Bridges to Care for all the work that you're doing to bring cohorts of congregations together in geographical proximity to uh, not only create community, but to help heal it. So thank you for that work. Um, we're going to move into our conversation today. And the first thing I'm going to do is just show you a spreadsheet. Don't you just love looking at spreadsheets? <laughs> but um, during COVID, uh, and still, right, all of these congregations, and these, <laughs> these are listed over here by uh, city council districts. We do that just because it helps us a little bit with where that is in San Antonio. But these congregations, and I'll kind of scroll through this uh, slowly, step forward and became vaccine pop-up sites in partnership with the city uh, during that time. And I know that every once in a while, these are re-engaged and partnered with. Um, you know, it's pretty significant. We have approximately 1,400 congregations of one uh, religion, faith expression, or another in our city. And again, so during the pandemic, these folks to whom I'm grateful in all the different council districts stepped up, partnered with the city, and um, helped to bring vaccines into our community in near community and proximity to folks who needed vaccines. So I wanted to share that as I introduce Sandra to us. Sandra is, and she can tell us how long she has been, but Sandra is fairly new, the vaccine equity manager. First, uh, Sandra, can you tell us what that means? Vaccine equity, can you tell us what that means? Sure. So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Anne, for having me. It's actually Vaccine Equity Officer through the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District. I've been in this uh, particular role for nine months. Um, basically, the role of a Vaccine Equity Officer is to um, ensure that we are diverse, equity, and inclusive in all vaccine-related activities. So my role predominantly is to look at all the systems, processes, internal, external, and ensure that we are offering um, equity uh, across the board to, um, to all marginalized communities. Thank you. Um, what I might do is pull up on screen the equity atlas so they can kind of see how we base that. So bring us the update on vaccines. You were telling me that we're in a different place and we're, we're going to be in a different yeah. place. So tell us what sure. does that place look like? So it's it's not as scary, <laughs> which is good to calm everyone, but there is a lot of fatigue out in the community. Um, we are transitioning from <clears throat> an emergency response mode to more of an endemic phase. However, as everybody knows, the endemic right now that is occurring is a, we call it tr the tri-endemic. 
because we're looking at COVID-19, flu, and RSV that is happening right now. And when I, when I talk about vaccines, I talk about all vaccines. So I talk about <clears throat> COVID-19, flu, RSV, MPV, monkeypox, polio, and back to school um, vaccinations. So what I utilize is I utilize data and I use the equity atlas that Anne provided um, <clears throat> and ensure that that's only one system of database uh, data source that I use to ensure that we're reaching and optimizing all of our resources to go to populations in San Antonio and Bear County that are in um, direct need. Here we go. I think it's coming up, Ben. There we go. Mm -hmm. So this is just one measure. It's This one's the Equity Atlas um, <clears throat> map. It's an interactive map that is available to everybody in the community. Um, you go to um, the sanantonio.gov slash equity slash initiatives atlas, and you can navigate exactly where <clears throat> the need is by an index score. The higher the index score, that means that the greater the need is there. So y'all have done a fantastic job in looking at, at the equity atlas and the faith-based organizations and combining those and seeing where the greatest need is and then honing in with the San Antonio Metropolitan Health District to provide additional pop-up um, clinics and vaccinations. Now, the only other thing that I do want to mention, and, and I, I don't want people to forget, not only do we have vaccines, but we also have uh, test uh, treatments so please remind individuals that treatments are available and these are the, the actual treatments that if you um, are vaccinated or unvaccinated, you can get the actual medication to um, shorten the length of the illness for, for specifically COVID. The other thing I do wanna mention is that funding is ending. Um, we anticipate funding, federal funding, government funding to end very, very soon at the beginning of next year where we're gonna try tr transition more to um, a different type of market. So vaccines eventually won't be easily available at, you know, free of charge at pharmacies. Thank you, um, Sandra. Does anybody have a question or a thought for Sandra? Just raise your hand. Um, then we'll transition to Trish. Um, Bill has put some information into chat about immunizations, so that's good. Thank you, Bill. That's sacred. Now, the well, other thing I, I, I did want to mention, Anne, is yeah. that we're also looking into the um, specifically um, refugees, um, migrants, and um, immigrants that are coming from the Ukraine. Um, we do have vaccinations for this population for polio as well. So if you know of any one polio vaccines, we do have specifically for the U Ukrainian population. And then at the pop-up clinics, we offer, always offer free COVID-19 vaccinations, including flu vaccinations that can't be co-administered. The best way to explain this to the community is if you haven't received your uh, booster or shot um, since September of this year, then it's time to get one. Thank you. We're so glad you're with us. What you're talking about, too, um, is how we uh, approach compassion in our city. We, you know, compassion is one of those words that can get stuck in our head. And really what we had, some of us who heard the mayor in his top 10 here in October, everything he talked about were acts of compassion on a citywide scale, ready to work, um, just all of those examples, but we're hearing yet another of hand-on example of compassion and action. And uh, thank you, Sandra, for the work in terms of the folks who are immigrating, the refugees who are settling, you know, everyone having access to vaccines and especially going to those places that are in highest need. So thank you. I hope you stay with us, Sandra, but we'll also understand if you need to get to work. So we're going to transition and others. If you think of a question for Sandra, uh, you could probably put that in chat or talk to her in chat kind of behind the scenes. Sandra, why don't you go ahead and put your email if you're okay with that into chat. So I'd also like to welcome someone. 
this morning from the land down under. So Trish, Sister Trish Madigan is with us and I hear, I think that she's leaving town today. So she's came in on Sunday night and is leaving yet today, but um, she, you know, graciously gave us some time. Uh, I hope that some of you read her bio. Trish, you might wanna go ahead and open your mic and get that ready. Um, she has done a lot of work um, in terms of interfaith, Christians, Muslims, Jews, dialogues working together. Uh, and her bio is long. So I sent that out yesterday and I'm gonna let you all read that so that we can get into the conversation right of the way. Somewhere in all of that, Trish, I read just a little snippet that really perked my ears. And the snippet was about how uh, faiths working together, people of different religions, different faith traditions, dialoguing, whatever. And I want to hear what that sounds like. But is, in one sense, a security measure in our world today. And um, we had, you know, a mass shooting in Uvalde uh, in May. And um, we've got, we live in a polarized time where violence can be on the rise. Trish, can you describe to me what that looks like and why that is? That that kind of thing, working together across faith is a security measure. Thank you, Anne, and um, thank you for having me on the meeting this morning. I feel very privileged to be here. I'm having a little trouble hearing you, so you might speak up a little bit, Trish. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thank you. Enjoy, a joy to be here. Uh, I think I, the best way to address that question, Anne, is uh, that to tell you a little story about what happened in Australia and in our region of the world, the oceanic region of the world, uh, when we had a, a a very disastrous event called, which we usually refer to as the Bali bombing. And Bali, is, for those who might be so aware, is Bali is a small island which is a part of Indonesia and our nearest neighbour. And Bali is actually completely a Hindu island. It's got a Hindu history, but the rest of uh, the rest of Indonesia is Muslim uh, majority. So um, Bali is a very popular holiday place for Australians because of the culture and the environment there. So in 2001, um, after the, uh, in 2002 rather, after the events of 2001, there was a, a, shoot, a bombing in Bali and it killed uh, over 80 Australians and a couple of hundred people generally who were college, mainly probably some, some locals and a lot of international visitors who were holidaying in Bali at the time. And it was a very shocking incident, especially for us because we really don't have um, much familiarity with that sort of activity in our region. So it, um, so it uh, really shocked us. So the government, Australian government, took a long time, it took quite a while to consider how to respond to that violent act. And they, it, it happened that the Australian um, uh, Federal Affairs Minister, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, Minister had a, a personal relationship with the Foreign Affairs Minister in Indonesia. So our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is what they do together, they, um, they must have had some consultations over some time. And by 2004, they had organized a, what they called a regional interfaith dialogue. So it was known as RID, Regional Interfaith Dialogue. And how it was going to be organized was that the two governments of Australia and Indonesia uh, would organize a, dial, a regional dialogue. 
between all the countries of the region. So uh, all the main countries anyway. So uh, there were all the countries of ASEAN, A-S-E-A-N, which is the organization for um, trade and interaction in many of the Asian countries. And Australia is actually not a part of that because we are not really classified as an Asian country. So they included four more countries from Oceania, which were Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, and um, there was another one, I've forgotten which one. Um, and we, uh, and they organized the meet, the first meeting took place in 2004. And it was held in Yogyakarta, which is not the capital of Indonesia, but it is the cultural capital of Indonesia with a wonderful history. So what each country was asked to do was to form a team of 10 people, which would ideally represent all the religions of the country that they were in. And uh, to come to the meeting and have a discussion about what will be our response to this event in our region. So I was a part of, of that. I was a part of the 10 people who came from Australia because I had, at that time I had a position in the Catholic Church in Sydney. I was the Director of Interfaith and Ecumenical Relations for Sydney Archdiocese. And the Sydney Archdiocese, the Catholic Archdiocese, would probably be the, the biggest, it's the most prestigious uh, Catholic diocese uh, historically in Australia. So I was included in that delega delegation and the government, our government's very secular in Australia. So it didn't really know what to do to talk to the religions. So it worked through uh, the National Council of Churches in Australia, which uh, the Catholic Church in Australia is a part of the National Catholic, uh, National Council of Churches and also the Religions for Peace movement, which includes all the um, other religions yeah, in Australia. So the government had to work with the leaders of those countries to sort of see how it would be the best way to respond. And uh, then each delegation was asked to have, to include women, to make sure that they include women in the delegation. Um, and so Australia had three women, and it was very often uh, three out of the 10 were women. Some countries had six, uh, I think Philippines and Singapore had half women. Many, some other countries had no women at all, even though that was one of the requests. But each country and organized it in their own way, uh, the, the group of 10, and some countries who saw themselves as a, the religion was a, the official religion of the country, they had their whole delegation was one religion sometimes, but that was that was a bit rare, really. So we all met in uh, Jogjakarta for the first meeting in 2004, and it was very um, initial. Like our government's not used to dealing uh, that much with religions; they leave religion to get on with themselves. <laughs> and we see ourselves as very secular. We we don't see. A, I, I think the United States would seem to take religion much more seriously in the public arena. So when we all arrived in Jogjakarta, um, no one really knew how to organise the meeting because um, it, we hadn't been used to doing that sort of thing. And so even the first opening, the opening um, morning, we had an uh, interfaith prayer. And now how do you do that? The, the government, Australian government and had no idea how to do it. So the uh, religions helped to work it out and they had a serial, what we call a serial prayer, where each religion prays for a short time in, in, in a line, not together, but in line. So we had a Jewish prayer and a Buddhist prayer and a Christian prayer and so on. And, and then we sort of broke up for, and then a couple of uh, government ministers from Indonesia and Australia um, addressed the meeting because they were the organising countries at first. And uh, then we broke, we broke up in what do you do with this group of people? So we, what we did is we broke up into workshops and each country was given a, a topic to work with. So one topic might be healthcare, another topic might be um, education was another topic and there were various topics. 
And so the countries were asked to work in little in mixed group workshops and come up with um, sort of programs that the government could uh, utilise. So, for example, in the what the result was for um, Australia is that we worked with the Indonesian government to finance education in many of the small value, uh, small little villages all over Indonesia that did not have any proper education system. And often what would happen there would be that a radicalised imam would come into a little village and he would, uh, 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 he would set up a little school and the parents would be so happy and send their children to this, to this little informal school and the children would be becoming radicalised. And uh, it was probably thought that the man who had come and shot the people in Bali, he was probably one of those people who had been radicalised in a very small Islamic um, village somewhere. So as a result of our meetings together, um, and there were six meetings altogether in different countries around that region, uh, and we came up with programs that we could do and, uh, um, and help the to work together as religions with the governments of those regions. So it was very important to have both the involvement of the religions, but also the involvement of the governments of each country. So when we went to a particular country, we were welcomed and we met with the president, usually the president or a high level official from the country was a part of the meeting. And, and um, it was very much involving governments and political leaders as well. So when we went to the Philippines, uh, Gloria Arroyo was the president of the Philippines at the time and she uh, gave us a lovely dinner in the, in the palace in Manila and she was a part of them. She came and addressed the meeting and this happened in all the different countries that we met in five, six different countries including Australia once and they were included Cambodia and New Zealand and the Philippines and, and we had two meetings in Indonesia, in different places of Indonesia. So as a result of those meetings, uh, Australia funded a whole program of uh, education in small villages throughout Indonesia, controlled and run by the government, but the Australian government provided the finance for the building of little schools, and the financing of appointing teachers, properly trained teachers, uh, in many villages all over Indonesia. So that was our, con our contribution that we were uh, asked to make. And other countries, they all did different things in their own countries and together with, with other faiths. So Trish, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. One, we're getting close to eight thirty. Yeah, so yeah. Gonna, I'm so glad you explained this. So. Um, I'm actually going to kind of translate it a bit. Yes, yes. And so for how we might be talking about similar things here. Yes. So there there was this event, this incident. Yes. And the action that was taken was to bring people together in dialogue, which we might also call a community conversation. We might call it at the intersection. We might call it a summit, a convening. We use all these kind of different words around here, but the importance of humans coming together and actually seeing each other and talking with each other and getting to know each other. You know, this is not rocket science. This is about humans coming and working together. And then I was going to ask you, so you know that coming together was an action. Mm -hmm. And then you you already took care of my next question because mm -hmm. then what came out of those dialogues, those conversations, much like what we're doing in San Antonio, are collaborations and future actions. That dialogue doesn't get stuck, which has often been the conversation around dialogue, doesn't get stuck in the conversation, mm -hmm. but humans can then start to work together in other directions towards healing. And so the equation that we're looking at in terms of a security measure, um, that's what gives us security as humans, is working together, being together, acting together, seeing others we might not normally 
be with and be together. So I really appreciate, um, I'm excited. It gives me hope. I, I'd love to hear from other places on the planet who are doing the same work because I think it then strengthens our work and it strengthens your work that we're not alone. And much like the research that we've been talking about as of late, it's humans survive not because of the survival of the fittest. The research shows that we survive because of cooperation and collaboration and working together. So we're going and, to pause. Yes, I'm going to pause. I want everybody to look in the chat box. Young Ann Helmke and friends called a gang summit. After they did that, murders in our city dropped by one third. And thank you. You know how to bring people together in conversations that lessen violence. Thanks, Ann. Well, thank you, Martha Ann. Um, and it's a perfect transition. Uh, it's 831. Those uh, that need to leave, as we always do, because we try to get the, the meat of it in, right, mm -hmm. in that half hour, and we really have today gotten a lot of information. Um, I'm going to have to leave. I've got that nine o'clock that's happening on just domestic violence prevention, but I want to make one last connection, and then I'm handing it over to Martha Ann, and you're all still welcome to stay. Um, but the other thing that I've heard prior to 8 a.m. this morning, one of the collaboratives that was formed just two days after the incident in Uvalde was our same society community collaborative um, about gun disarmament. How do we prepare as a community? How do we have those conversations? And so I heard and maybe even Paul will step in a little bit. I heard some conversation about what Australia has done in terms of guns, disarmament and safety. So um, next week, don't forget, remember, we won't be meeting. Um, I give thanks for all of you and um, that you have a beautiful Thursday of giving thanks with family and friends. And uh, we'll all be back together in two weeks, believe it or not, in December. So I'm, I'm walking out now. I'm handing facilitation over to Martha Ann in a conversation. I'm going to let Paul jump in. Why don't you, because I know Paul can do this. Paul, why don't you just go ahead and start with that and unmute yourself? Okay. Well, fortunately, we have a board this morning. Uh, folks like Arthur Dawes and Mark Wittig, who have been uh, just a vital part of this conversation, and has uh, and I know they have many thoughts along those those lines as well. What we have shared uh, are the examples from uh, Australia, uh, UK after the uh, was that the Dunblane uh, shooting incident, and then most recently. Uh, steps taken by the uh, Prime Minister of Canada, uh, first in the uh, banning of assault weapons, and secondly, of the collection of handguns, things that uh, were, let's put it this way, that uh, uh, folks in the United States uh, have uh, only begun to, to talk about and think about. Uh, and so, Perhaps uh, as we continue uh, talking with uh, with Trish, uh, we can uh, uh, focus on those things as well as other other areas of your writings, especially the role of women you know, in various uh, uh, religious traditions. Uh, it interests me a great deal. Uh, I've been asked, for example, recently. <clears throat> to give invocations, uh, this opening up of a senior center where uh, I had uh, been part of the advisory group. And I got several comments, fortunately, mostly favorable. When I opened my prayer with the way uh, I, my, my wife and I uh, say grace at home, and that is using the expression, mother and father God. 
And so uh, with that, I, I wanted to uh, ask you uh, your thoughts about uh, uh, your other writings as well as, as the ones we've been talking about. And, and uh, Sister Martha Ann, if you would, uh, if you would manage this, uh, you do it so well. Um, I'm going to mention that uh, Trish and I got a grant from the uh, Guran Institute at the University of Houston. And we were in Iraq and we interviewed three generations of Iraqi women, uh, young women like university students or graduates, their mothers are their aunts, their grandmothers are their great aunts about their education, their challenges, their hopes for peace. Um, our Peace Center published that book, Iraqi Women of Three Generations by Martha and Trish. But Trish has a lot of other experience with women in research and I'll be quiet. <laughs> I thought Martha was doing quite well, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, was, I guess growing up uh, in the post Vatican II world as a Catholic, uh, you know, I was I was just could not but be aware of the role of women in the church uh, and in the world, probably. So I guess I've always been very interested in that. And uh, and I, I've worked a lot with Muslim women's organisations in particular because my doctoral study was on fundamentalism in Catholicism and in Islam and how it affected women. That's what I did my doctorate on. So I was in big conversations with a lot of Muslim women, particularly, and they that it was a, so fascinating because they were experiencing exactly the same sort of things as women in the Catholic Church were at that time were experiencing. For example, you know they were not allowed to speak in the mosque uh, and, and things like that. And we said, well, we're not women in the Catholic Church can't speak in the church either, you know. And then when we kind of said, why is that? We realized that these were these teachings in our uh, or cultural um, to, uh, cultural rules in our groups that had nothing to do with our faith, really. You know, so it was a big eye opener for us. And, we, and so um, we started to you know, get involved together working in feminist issues in, in the church and in the mosque and in the world. Um, so that's been a big focus. There's always been something to focus on with that object uh, in our heads. And um, so it's been fascinating and it's brought women to, from the different religions, it's brought the women together because whether you're a Hindu or a Buddhist or whatever, um, women are suffering a kind of diminishment of who they are as, as people in every religious tradition. So it's not related to just one religious tradition that we might we often think it's just our church or our mosque or our temple and uh we realize that it's much bigger than that so i guess that's where i've been focused and um there's a lot of things we do together as women and it's built our relationships together and it's been a very positive sort of thing for all of us Two, two traditions uh, that are very strong in San Antonio are uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the more progressive branch of the Lutheran Church, and also Reformed Judaism. And I was uh, uh, pleasantly surprised to see that in both of those traditions in the United States, uh, they both began ordaining women. Uh, in 1970 and 1971, within a year of one another, and I thought, my goodness, this is uh, this is an interesting sign. Yes, uh, I, th I think with um, in the Catholic Church, particularly with the synod going on, the synod on synodality that Pope Francis has started as a process. I think a lot of women who had almost given up hope, and many many have given up hope. Uh, but I think it's renewed the hope for some of us that it's still worth persevering in. It's still worth working towards it because we can see hope 
on the horizon and it mightn't happen nothing might happen very oh well something's going to happen soon but it's very interesting to uh, analyze the conversations now that are coming out and being put together from all over the world about catholic women and ordination of women is now on the agenda which we've been told for so long it can't be talked about because it's so set in what jesus wanted for the church so this is now on the agenda uh, for the synod on synodality and a lot of, along with a lot of other uh, very important religious kind of issues too so uh, I, I do think for women uh, there is something opening up on the horizons of the the world and the, and the church and of course when you look at the world can seem as though well especially in the western world women can seem to have a lot of rights but you know when you analyze it women are still very underrepresented in in parliament uh, in australia in in, um, in, the in the political world in the business world uh, so really women still have a long way, way to go to uh, achieving equality in nearly every aspect of life and so religion is just one part of that but it is a very important part so uh, yeah I, I think um the whole issue of women is since the second wave movement of uh, feminism and now we're i think we're in the third wave now but i think the it's a, a still an ongoing journey for women in the world the united nations sustainable development goals those excellent 17 things for us to work on together number five is gender equity and the un has posted at the current rate of progress it will be about 40 years before women have equity in governmental leadership in the world. And I was with some young women and I said, that's not soon enough, uh, 40 years for women to have equity in governing bodies is not soon enough. But I would like to make a parallel that there are many underrepresented groups so at the beginning, when I announced we all need to do the Black History Tour of San Antonio, we need the gifts of every person. You know, we need the gifts of every person in the world. And so how are we respecting, listening to voices, bringing more people into conversation and opportunity? I, I saw Arthur Dawes of uh, Pax Christi had his hand up a little while ago. Arthur, did you want to add something? Uh, you're you're muted. That was a thumbs up for what Sister would say, and and I do believe that the freedom of one is the freedom of all. None like just like you said, if women are oppressed, we're all oppressed, and that is also a measure of of our level of world oppression. Uh, yes, I think that's uh, very right. And also, I was just thinking to the issue of coloured women and minority women as well. And um, I, I think as a white woman, I have to be very keep reminding myself and being very aware of those because sometimes we can get into our own little bubble and just be thinking about people like us and i know it's always a challenge for white for me as a white person uh, to think well how is it for aboriginal women in our country and how is it for those many women who have come as migrants into the country uh, so you know there is all those other aspects of it too to keep being trying to be aware of and trying to be informed about as well Thank you, Arthur, for your comment. I have one other thing to say, and I think I think we need to hear the voices of what it's like to be a, from the voices of oppression. We need to hear what they have to teach us, what they think we don't, we're not hearing. Uh, Trish, is uh, it, it possible to keep in touch with you? Perhaps uh, if you were able to share your email address, we can. Uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, there's a way in which we uh, continue our discussion. Mm, okay, that'd be good. I, um, uh, 
everyone can see our DAWs email address uh, in his Zoom box. And um, this year is the 50th anniversary of the International Pax Christi. Um, after the Second World War, they raised the conversation. You know, we French and Germans were killing each other. Um, how can we get back in good human relationship? So there is a branch, Pax Christi, Texas. It's our 25th anniversary. We are a group that works on many justice issues. We're in Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, Austin. So you can come online or you can come to the chapel of the Incarnate Word Sunday morning. So Art could send you all the information if you're interested in joining us first in conversation and then uh, with Bishop Mike Pfeiffer leading in the Sunday uh, Eucharist. So this is the time to close our gathering, but Anne said we could stay in the Zoom room. So Paul and Trish, if you want to talk a little bit about gun safety uh, and anybody else that wants to talk about gun safety, uh, stay in the Zoom room. And thank you people for coming to at the intersection this morning.